Hello, welcome to another wonderful evening of programming with the Kansas City Public Library. I'm Cindy Hole, Director of Branch Operations and President of the American Indian Library Association. We are honored to host tonight Dr. Daniel Wildcat, Professor of Indigenous and American Indian Studies at the Haskell Indian Nations University. Dr. Wildcat is here to present information, talk about his book, Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge. And we're going to have a great discussion about his insights, his knowledge, his wisdom that he will be sharing with us. And we're so pleased to welcome Dr. Wildcat with us this evening. At the end of our program, we will allow everyone an opportunity to ask questions. And we will ask you to put those questions into the chat box on the YouTube page. We're very pleased to introduce Dr. Daniel Wildcat. Thank you so much, Cindy. Passant, c'est la gui, Zoya ha, Yuchi ha. Good evening, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. My name is uh, Dan Wildcat. I am a Yuchi member of the Muscogee Nation of Oklahoma, otherwise known as the Creek Nation. And I'm speaking to you, um, you know, a little less than. Uh, a half a mile as the crow flies, maybe even more like a, a quarter of a mile as the crow flies from the south bank of the Kansas River as it meanders across the north edge of uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And so I want to acknowledge this, this place I sit, this land. Um, I want to honor the first earth keepers of this place, uh, the Kanza who called this their home uh, or the Ka Nation. Uh, ironically, now the Ka Nation of Oklahoma, they were removed from this state which, from which, you know, their name uh, is the source of the name of the state of Kansas. But they were removed to Oklahoma by government policy. So uh, another ironic and, and, and sad story there. But, um, I want to acknowledge this place, this land. Um, so I'm sitting, you know, close to the south bank of the Kaw River as it meanders across the north edge of Kansas and probably no more than two miles uh, north of uh, Haskell Indian Nations University, my home institution in Lawrence, Kansas, which sits really uh, adjacent to actually uh, sits on the northern edge of the Wakarusa wetlands, the wetlands that were created by the Wakarusa River. And so, um, you know, that place well known by Osage and many indigenous peoples who moved through this area. But I think it, it's good to always, you know, honor the land, the soil, the water, you know, of the place where we reside. So I wanted to start with that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of a, a great way to, to really begin an introduction um, to what I want to talk about today. And, and that's sort of this evening. I want to talk about sort of the challenges that we're going to face in the immediate future. I can't even say near future now. We're in the midst of of climate change right now. People who are paying attention see that, they recognize it, um, they're experiencing that. And I think it really poses a lot of interesting challenges to those of us uh, who are mindful of our relationship to the land, the air, the water, the life that surrounds us. And uh, so what I'd like to do is start with a very simple proposition, and that's this. Uh, the motivating factor for doing my book, Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge, was, was really twofold. First, it was to make an argument that Indigenous people do have wisdom and knowledge, very practical knowledge and wisdom that we should be considering today as we think about how we are going to deal with the very difficult problems that we're facing. You know, it's kind of interesting, the two most 
commonly used quotations today by people who do public speaking and are uh, thought of as, as thought leaders are often are, are apocryphal. And by that, I mean uh, they're attributed to uh, people who we can find no evidence that they ever said these things. But again, it's maybe pop culture, you know, kind of um, or uh, uh, in a strange way. Um, the first quote is that one that's attributed to Albert Einstein, who uh, after he escaped Nazi Germany and landed in Princeton, New, uh, New Jersey, um, at Princeton University, you know, was given a difficult problem to look at by a colleague. And several days later, when he came back, asked if he had any advice. And, and again, the quote attributed to Einstein goes something like this. Remember, you can't fix problems with the same kind of thinking that created them. So my first point would be that, you know, we've had five centuries now of uh, really a, a, a colonial uh, expression and imposition of, you know, predominantly Western worldviews. And um, where we're at today is in a major global climate crisis. Of course, we've got a lot of crises. If you're really honest and look around us, uh, governmental crises, economic crises, justice crises. And it's not just here, it's, it's all over the planet. But I think the point I want to make is, you know, if we need to find a different way of thinking, we might do well to begin with the worldviews and the wisdom of the first peoples of this land. I think they have real knowledge. I think we possess um, some good insights that could be very practically applied to addressing a lot of the problems we face today. The other, the other quote that's, you know, again, it's uh, so often used, and yet we can find no evidence that Mark Twain ever said this. And it goes something like this. You've heard it before, I'm sure. Um, allegedly advice to a younger man. Um, remember, remember, it's not what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know that just ain't so that causes all the problems. So I think we're in a period now where we, everyone needs to really think very deeply about a lot of the received knowledge or views or the things that we hold, we think we know. And it may be a good time to really do a reassessment of those. So when I wrote Red Alert, Saving the Planet with Indigenous Knowledge, I wanted to emphasize the fact that Indigenous knowledges have an incredible advantage, I think, in the world we live in today of trying to solve problems because it is um, quite literally not an anthropocentric knowledge. In our most ancient traditions, indigenous traditions, we looked at really our life among the balance of creation as not one that was full of resources, natural resources, but really full of relatives. Now think about that. That's an interesting kind of notion. What would happen if tonight when we leave this program, this virtual program, this virtual space, think what would happen if we walked out of our doors and said, you know, I'm going to start living my life as a relative to the plants, to the animals, to all of the life that surrounds us, the land itself, which is living, right? We know that. I think E.O. Wilson has uh, has projected that we may have as many as, you know, um, seven, eight, nine uh, million, you know, unnamed uh, microbial, uh, unidentified microbial species in the soil. The soil itself is made up of water and, and that microbial life and air 
and that's what gives us variations in different kinds of soil, right? How those are combined, land, air, and water. So I think that, that we've got an opportunity now to sort of take seriously the voices of indigenous people. That's what I wrote about 10 years ago. That's what I'm trying to currently update into a new edition of Red Alert. And again, that notion of indigenous knowledge, it, um, I'm going to say that up front in this new edition rather than at the end of the book. Um, someone might say, well, that sounds like terribly anthropocentric knowledge. So indigenous knowledges are going to save us, the knowledges of indigenous people. Well, that's where the catch comes because in the strictest manner of speaking, in many native traditions, our teachers were understood quite literally as the plants, the animals, the insects, the birds, the fish, and they were treated as relatives. I remember um, uh, the 20th, fifth anniversary of Earth Day, my colleague, George Godfrey, a, a member of the Citizens Band Pottawatomie of Oklahoma, who at that time uh, was the first director of the Haskell Environmental Research Study Center. We got asked by USDA to go do a program uh, on the 25th anniversary of Earth Day in Washington, DC. And we got permission to set TPs up and do a couple of days of storytelling, knowledge sharing, singing, cultural demonstrations on the ellipse across from the White House. And Orrin Lyons gave uh, an Onondaga faith keeper, uh, probably one of the most well-known um, indigenous uh, wisdom keepers in North America, uh, gave this marvelous talk. And uh, in one part of it, he said, you know, when we have people from New York State come to Onondaga, uh, to our land, uh, he says, you know, they, they'll often begin by saying, well, we're here to talk about, you know, how you can better manage your natural resources. And Oren said he stopped them short. And he said, well, I want to correct you on one thing. In our language, we have no word for resources, but we do acknowledge the deer, the birds, the plants, all of those animals of our land uh, as relatives. And that stuck with me. And I had heard that same kind of sentiment expressed time and time again. And so I think, you know, that's, that's really something to explore. And if you think about it, thinking of the way in which humans are to the balance of biological life on the planet, if you think about the way in which we are connected in all these complex relationships uh, that we are part of and some of which we create, um, that's really the cornerstone of modern evolutionary theory and, and modern environmental science. And so I think that there's nothing romantic about that kind of thinking. I think indeed it opens itself to very complex um, appreciation for the world that we are a part of. And so, you know, I, I would suggest that part of, you know, why we should listen to indigenous voices right now, those people that are still connected to their uh, cultural ways, their um, indigenous worldviews, is those worldviews really express something uh, that's very different than what we're constantly complaining about today. And being in higher education, I hear this all the time. Our biggest problem is our knowledge is in, is in silos. So we have the sciences and the humanities and engineering and medicine and lawyers. And what do you have at the end of the day? You have highly trained professionals who can't even talk to each other because I've got such a highly specialized technical language that it's hard for them even to share, you know, knowledge across disciplines. So I would suggest to you that the kind of holistic, very complicated holistic worldviews that indigenous people have are really well suited to us when we wanna tackle the complicated questions of how 
humankind can live today. So that first principle would be would be pretty simple. That you know we need to really uh, think of what it would mean to move from a way of thinking of a, in a world full of natural resources to a world full of relatives, and that has the benefit that you know now we can think of a larger kind of uh, eco-cultural an ecological and cultural community that humankind is a member of. And so as we do that, it has all these other benefits. One of them is, you know, at least in my family, you don't treat your relatives uh, with disrespect. You respect them. And that's, and um, related to this kind of, of, of move, We've seen recently, and this year we've seen it, I mean, in, you know, almost full force, this kind of um, over preoccupation with what some people would call their inalienable rights. Now, I want to make very, my point here, the second point, very clear. Inalienable rights are valued by indigenous peoples. I know a few people in the world who most highly value the unique gift of individual expression, liberty, as you will find among tribal peoples. But they also tend to look at that, those inalienable rights as hollow if they are not co-joined or counterbalanced with inalienable responsibilities. I mean, look at the world we live in. We've, we've had a whole discussion now for a year about whether people should wear masks. And in indigenous ways of thinking, this debate, that, that argument has little to do with inalienable rights. It only comes down to inalienable rights if you have an absence of appreciation for inalienable responsibilities. Because when you live among relatives, you must show respect. You must exercise responsibility in those relationships that you have. And, you know, when we live among resources, all we think about is who has the right to use what. So again, you start to see a very shift in how you think about the world and how you're going to approach problem solving. So on one hand, you know, full of resources, what do we end up arguing about? Well, whose property is that, those resources, and who has a right to use them? Let's, let's get in court and have big arguments about that, okay? And in indigenous ways of thinking, no. The real question is, is we need to think about how we can live well as responsible relatives to the land, to the air, to the water. And again, don't hit me up with that. That's some kind of romantic idea. That's modern biology. That's modern environmental science. And I think in some ways, indigenous traditions and intellectual traditions and worldviews and principles that are often you know, expressed through custom, habit, tradition could really bear some some good fruit if we thought about how we might apply some of those to difficult problems we are facing today. Um, that also has an advantage too of notice when you start thinking of yourselves and as my friend uh, Steve Pavlik, uh, like myself, a student of Vine Deloria Juniors, um, used to refer to this as a kin-centric view of the world. He says, you know, it's really it's really a kin-centric view of the world. And so um, it's, and, and, you know, again, nothing romantic about this. If you look at our social organization, often when you find clan systems, what, where do the clans get their names from? Well, from the plants, from the animals. Uh, in the, among the Southern tribes, one of the most important clans is the wind clan, part of nature. You know, when that air moves, the wind clan. And, and what is, 
what does that naming do for us? Well, it reminds us just that, that we are related to the wind, to the water, to the deer, to the eagle, to the buzzard, you know, to the rabbit, to the possum. And I think that's, again, um, that shines some light on some things that modern human, human beings have largely forgotten. That we aren't, that, that we live in such a way that we forget that we really are a small but significant part of these complex life systems that surround us. So I would suggest to you that if we took those, those first two principles, you know, kind of uh, this idea, let's, let's move from, take seriously a considera consideration of what the world would look like if we took indigenous traditions and thought of ourselves as no longer living among resources, but among relatives, okay? That would have some immediate, I think, benefits in terms of how we approach solving problems and where we look for problems, okay? Um, and the corollary to that, the second, you know, premise is that one that says, well, you know, also, if we move from resources to relatives, we can then counterbalance this over inordinate preoccupation with, quote, inalienable rights. I mean, we've seen that this last year with, again, that the home wearing of masks. And so, well, no, you can't make me do that. That's my inalienable right. And within, from an indigenous perspective, the question would immediately be, well, what about your inalienable responsibilities? Don't you have any responsibilities to even your own human kin? And I think that that's, that's important to acknowledge. So I think, you know, moving, we would maybe reframe questions about who owns what and who has the right to use what on the planet that we have amongst this tremendous kinship wealth to what is our responsibility? How do we behave responsib responsibly? And I think that, you know, um, that's where I, I find tremendous optimism. When I wrote Red Alert, it's a small book, 150 pages, but it was a real challenge because as I was, um, initially just catching up on all the scientific research about climate change, uh, quite frankly, I was getting pretty depressed because I was going like, oh my gosh, what have we done? And how are we going to turn this around? You know, and, and I remember, you know, reaching out to some of those wisdom keepers, elders that I've had the privilege to know in my, uh, you know, 25, well, at that time, um, you know, uh, 20, 20 years at, at Haskell and and um, I I remember I can't remember where it's Henrietta Mann, Oscar Coagley, Albert Whitehat. They all sort of basically told me the same thing. You know, don't forget that we have lots of teachers. It's not just teachers. It's those plant and animal teachers, the life that surrounds us, and they can teach us. And, you know, that really gave me, again, a sense of hope, because no matter, even regardless of how much damage humankind has done at this point, we're still surrounded by a tremendous amount of, of life, non-human life that we share this planet with. And so when you start trying to really think about that and be mindful and conscious of that, I think it has tremendous benefits. Uh, some of you, um, you know, are uh, probably aware of Robin Kimmerer's beautiful uh, work, Braiding Sweetgrass. And, you know, she talks about the power and the knowledge one learns from gardening, building relationships with plants. Those of you that are gardeners, um, I'm preaching to the choir. You know what I'm talking about. But the point is that we can become 
better human beings, more competent human beings by establishing these kinds of, of relationships. So, you know, when I think about that, it makes me want to think that, you know, we've got hope because we've got a lot of relatives that are still among us, non-human relatives, that if we'd start paying attention again, they just might teach us something about how to live more maturely, more responsibly as human beings. So this is a, a big plug for, you know, uh, looking at ways that scientists and indigenous people can work together to try to address these very complex, you know, interrelated problems. What many uh, scientists today are referring to as wicked problems. These are wicked because there's so many threads in these relationships and they're all entangled and they're all hard to pull apart. Well, that that is where you need, I think, thinkers that are fundamentally their worldviews are organized around relationships and processes. And so, and I think that's something that, that many indigenous peoples still hold in their own cultural traditions and tribal worldviews. So I, th I think, you know, there's, there's reason to be hopeful. So if you can't fix problems with the same kind of thinking that created them, maybe it's time to really think about, you know, some of the wisdom, Lakota, Dakota, Diné, Passamaquoddy, Anishinaabe, Lummi people have. Now, again, as you do this, remember, I'm not advocating that people go try to appropriate everything from natives. No, that would be disrespectful. So it's really about how we start to facilitate respectful, true partnership and collaboration. Of course, that's what my life's been largely about since uh, the formation of the Haskell Environmental Research Study Center uh, in the mid 1990s. And that was that Haskell Center was created with a partnership from uh, Kansas State University, their um, Center for Hazardous Substance Research. And um, we created the HER Center. And, um, you know, like all things that are grant funded, has had its ups and downs and continues on as basically a place where we have undergraduate research programs and those kinds of things going on, although not really a staff per se. But um, so I I am hopeful and I, I'm in no way um, anti-technology. I just think that again, Technology has largely been viewed in the dominant society as an independent variable. I think it's a dependent variable. I think the thing that we've got to do is to not treat technology as a standalone value. In fact, uh, I would argue the value of it is related to kind of a functional statement with uh, uh, the numerator, what I call the three C's. You ask yourself, you know, what's the value of culture? communication and um, um, community. And those are the numerators, I call them the three C's over what? E, the environment. And as a simple kind of expression of value, it has, a, I, I think it puts us in the right direction. Um, Technology is not this, this independent value. It's dependent on the context, the use, how it is understood. Um, we all know now, while we're grateful to have this kind of opportunity to create this space tonight, we all know we see all around us examples of how these kinds of virtual spaces can create tremendous problems even spread falsehoods and, and disinformation. And I think this is, this is that's, that's a real part of this technology. So we have to reframe it, how we think about it. I've always said, well, you always want it to, if it can't enhance those three C's, your sense of community, the strength of your culture and communication, then 
maybe that's something, you know, you don't want to use. Not everything that humans can do uh, necessarily should be done. And that's, again, an, an, an interesting kind of, you know, notion uh, to really explore in some depth. But about technology, I really feel like that, um, well, we tend to think of technology very anthropocentrically, you know, it's all about us, right? We're the primary, not the only, there are other species on the planet that make things and do things and are creative. We're finding out more and more about that almost every year. Um, uh, but by and large, we uh, create and make things in a uh, scale and in a manner that is, you know, inordinately disproportionate to what, you know, other life species on the planet might do. Doesn't mean it's necessary, our way is necessarily better or what we make is better. But I do think that, um, you know, the things we should consider is that technology is not all about our human comfort, our human convenience, or our human profit. That if you take this kind of worldview approach I'm advocating that we reconsider and take seriously as we're facing climate change, this sort of kin-centric view of the world, that one of the advantages might be is that um, we could substitute another measure for what we think good work would entail. And that good work would entail what I think we would call um, the promotion of systems of life enhancement. Are the choices we make, are the technologies we employ such that they diminish life and diversity on the planet? Or do we actually make choices as we develop technologies, as we think of solutions that enrich the diversity, the life diversity on the planet, and in fact, engage in what I would call the promotion of systems of life enhancement, not just human life enhancement, but enhancement in enhancement of the quality of the water that we drink, that we, that we use. And um, of course, all the plants and life that we share this thin biosphere of this mother earth. Um, uh, that we share uh, that biosphere with, all of that diversity of life. Again, I don't, to me, that none of what I've talked about is, is romantic at all. It poses some real challenges and it really gives us a great um, sort of research agenda that we might start exploring. If we started thinking about you know, uh, finding the value of our lives again, again, not through the books we read or these programs that we, you know, engage in, you know, on virtual spaces like this, but in real relationships the, with the world out of doors. Uh, I'm a big advocate. Um, uh, one of the things we should immediately do so people will value the life around them is get our K through 12 um, students out of doors. I don't know why we insist that they sit in buildings for hours. Often, of course, with young kids, we know that that's almost impossible to get them to sit still and pay attention. And it seems to me that we could teach a lot of science. We could teach a lot of geography. We could teach writing. We could teach, we could teach art. We could teach um, music out of doors. And I think, again, that's one of the things that, that 
need to seriously undertake. You know, the primary, you know, model of science is the experimental method. And, and I'm not dissing that. There's a lot of knowledge you can get through the use of a quote, controlled experiment. But now a lot of the problems we face, we can't put in a controlled experimental setting. Climate change, the decline in biological uh, uh, diversity, air quality, water quality issues. Why? Because it's in this complex world's life system that we're a part of. So I would say there's a place for reintroducing really and, and encouraging experiential knowledge, knowledge that is born from people who learn to pay attention to the other life around them and what that means. And some of you on this, on this program, I'm sure maybe come from a farm, maybe from a farm background, at least a generation two or three generations ago, if you're from the Midwest. And uh, if you're like me and my maternal grandparents were, were small, and, and I mean, I'm not talking about one section of land. I, when I mean small farmers, that were maybe that last generation of farmers in Southeast Kansas who, you know, at one time had a milk cow, would always have at least, you know, some pigs and, and one pig they could butcher every year for some pork and a big garden, a garden with beans, with uh, corn, with squash, um, you know, and some fruit trees. And they lived off of that pretty much. Had some chickens. That's gone today by and large. But here's what I wanna remind you, any of you who had relatives, ancestors, who lived that way, they knew a lot about the world outside their door. And they didn't have to necessarily look at their phone app or their iPad app to figure out when they should plant, when they should sow, when they should harvest. But they learned by paying attention and to look for those signs that told them when it was time to do something. By and large, most of modern humankind in industrial society has lost that. And th for those of you that would say, well, good riddance, we don't need that anymore. I would say that if you look very honestly at what is going on with the industrialization uh, and uh, commodification of the food we eat, I think there's good reason to be concerned about that kind of machine production view of food of those plant relatives. And I, I, would, I think we've got an opportunity to have some really great research projects. And I would just uh, make the case that now more than ever, uh, the planet is issuing a red alert. And those people who are paying attention are hearing it loud and clear, and it might be time for us to reevaluate those things we think we're so confident in knowing, and maybe remember, if we can't fix problems with the same kind of thinking that created them, it might be a good time to listen to what indigenous people can tell us, because as far as I can see, they have not played a major role in creating the global climate crisis that we're facing. I'm gonna stop there and I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, discussion, questions, comments, and uh, you know, the floor is open. Right, Daniel, I think we're just waiting for Cindy to pop back in here and it looks like she is on her way. 
So All I, will, right. I, will, I will duck out. I just didn't want you to work. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you so much. We could talk for hours on this and we so appreciate your scholarship and being able to help us have these discussions and ask these questions as we deepen our understanding of the methodology of indigenous knowledge in modern times. Yeah. Uh -huh. We have we have a few questions. Okay, uh, cool. From our audience members. So uh, here's one. Is there anything Native American history and or culture can teach specifically about compromise on environmental policy? It mm -hmm. seems days we don't really fight about where we need to go so much as how fast we should be getting there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so, you know, it's, and, and this is one of the things. So one of the things uh, I've been active in this past year is re-envisioning a historic building on our campus, Hiawatha Hall. If any of you've ever been to the Haskell campus, a hundred year old limestone, Kansas limestone building, beautiful. It had served as a chapel at one point in time, fallen into incredible disrepair and really has not been used for almost 20 years now. And I've been championing, re-envisioning that building as the Hiawatha Center for Justice. And so I'm working on that now with the support of our at Haskell. Um, and um, I think one of the things we need to do is we need to learn how to facilitate difficult discussions because I do think right now that the problems is um, before we enter into difficult discussions, we have people, you know, um, uh, wanting to call someone out. And I've always said, you know, I, I, that's not a good way to start a, a meaningful dialogue. And so, um, Hiawatha, you know, was Onondaga. Hiawatha was uh, instrumental in forming the so-called Iroquoian Confederacy. He's one of the individuals who sought out the peacemaker to bring the great law of peace to unite the six nations of the Haudenosaunee and um, the Iroquoian Confederacy. And one of the things they talk about is trying to become of one good mind. And I think what we desperately need are places, libraries could be one of them. Our schools could again be these places where we bring people together, not to call people out, but to call people in and say, let's start the difficult discussions to see if there's some way we can come of one good mind. I've heard the people in, of the longhouses today of the Iroquois talk about, that's how their decisions are made. And, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, to try to bring people to one good mind. And then that might involve, you know, some compromise. That might involve, you know, rethinking our own positions. But I couldn't agree with you more. I, I right now think that's one of the biggest challenges we face, and that's why I'm promoting this creation of the Hiawatha Center for Justice that could become just that kind of place. Cindy, I can't hear you. Okay. Great, well, thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. no, you can. Um, so why is it that indigenous people seem to care so much about the land when yeah. they're in relationship to others. Can you tell us? Yeah. More? My, uh, you know, my, my dear friend and mentor, Vine Deloria Jr. said, you know, one of the most important philosophical differences between American Indians and Western Europeans was that American Indians hold their lands, their places as having the highest possible meaning and that all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. And so um, I'm thank you for this question because I would kill myself if I hadn't really, it would have really been upset with myself if I hadn't made this point very explicitly. Why that 
times is because there's another thing that we need to really appreciate about indigenous culture. Indigenous cultures and life ways, even our languages, our ceremonies, obviously our food, our dwellings, our clothing, were given to us by the particular landscapes that we call home. And so really our cultures were this emerged over hundreds and thousands of years of this symbiotic relationship between a people and a place. Again, nothing romantic about that. And if you think about the power of geography and the way that shapes, you know, or used to shape, you know, human life, what we ate, how we dress, the kinds of houses we built. Uh, I think that's why indigenous people really understood their very identity as tied to those geographies. So we know for the United Sioux Nations of the Northern Plains, why they hold the Black Hills as such a sacred landscape. They all knew the Black Hills. They all followed the buffalo through there and hunted the buffalo. Why do the Navajo not mark their land, what they call Dineta, as those four sacred mountains that mark out their, their geography, their homeland? And so I think that's why we live in a society today where people's differences are ideological, are political, are where they shop, you know, uh, 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 those kinds of things. And for indigenous people, our cultures were part of the fabric of this incredible relationship between a people and a place. I think that's really the, the best explanation you can give, you know. And so they still remember that, right? They still, even those of us that have been removed, I'm, I'm one of those tribes that, you know, our homelands were in Georgia, but we were on that trail of tears, the most famous trail of tears, there were many. Those of you in Kansas City know that, you know there are tribes that were moved to that region on trails of tears too. Uh, but that's it, is that our cultures our physical cultures, our symbolic cultures, our worldviews were reflections of that symbiotic relationship between people and a place. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a, a twofold question for you. Yeah. So what is, what is our greatest opportunity as human relatives to prepare our communities for future generations? Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's work for everyone to do as we start thinking about how we're going to prepare our children. I think about this a lot, you know, I've got a grandson who's 18, a granddaughter who is six. And I look at them and I think, okay, my gosh, what, what kind of world am I leaving them? And I would say um, the, the biggest thing that we can do right now is one, Try not to paralyze them with fear. Um, did a program a couple of weeks ago and in, in, um, with some folks there in, in Kansas City um, and an organization called Resilient Activists. And, and um, you know, it was about really how people, many people are feeling paralyzed, depressed and everything about climate change. It does affect people and they're worried and I think the main thing we've got to do is to give them hope. And one of the ways I think we can give them hope is to make a real effort to let them understand that, you know, we are surrounded by a tremendous amount of life still on this planet. Much of it beautiful. In fact, I always think of when we think of the ugliness of the world today, by and large, that's human produced. But when we look at the eagles down here on the Kansas River, you know, what is really cold, the eagles all come to the bridge right there, downtown, north, downtown Lawrence, Kansas. Why? Well, the dam keeps the water open and the eagles come there to fish. And I think of the pure joy of watching eagles fish and you're going like, wow, 
that sort of tells you something about creation, about the world. We need more of those kinds of things we can give young people. So I'm a real advocate of trying to get people out of doors as much as we can, get them to appreciate that, to understand that, to feel comfortable in it, not be afraid of it. And um, so I think that's one of the things we can do. And by focusing kind of on those kinds of things, um, you don't get all caught up in the doom and gloom that really, you know, like I said, when I was working on Red Alert back in 2007 and 2008, and I started really reading carefully, you know, uh, what climate scientists were telling us, the atmospheric scientists about CO2 and, and uh, global uh, warming at that time is what we, we, they wanted to call it. Talk. Climate change because we know it is on the planet, our very diverse planet. But I, again, the part that gave me hope was saying, you know, I've got to quit just looking at our human reports. Let's pay attention to what the trees and the plants and the animals can still give us. And uh, I, so I, that's one of the things. Let's get young people out of doors more frequently and talk to them about the relationships they have, where their water comes from, you know, not out of the faucet, but where that water that when you turn on the faucet, where does that water come from, you know? And I think, so there's a lot of that we can teach that's very practical that can help this generation, younger generation, get prepared and realize um, we don't have to just look to ourselves. We can look around us for some lessons about maybe how to do things differently. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. We have a, another question from the audience and um, they say, I'm hearing more and more from people who think that our current climate crisis is going to lead into the collapse of our current consumer culture in the very near future. What's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think, it won't, this is the, this is the thing about our planet, right? And, and that is, my, so the response I would have would be, you know, where, where will the, the consumer culture collapse? Not every place on the planet is fully immersed in a consumer culture like those of us in very advanced industrial societies are now post-industrial societies. <laughs> But I do think there, there may be, a, a, and there is, a very serious move of some people with what's being referred to sometimes as intentional communities, desires to kind of think of creating communities that aren't driven by a consumer culture, that aren't driven by this notion that uh, one is measured as rich according to the number of resources you own, but relative to the indigenous calculation of wealth would be you're wealthy as a function of how many good relatives you have, how many good relationships you have. And I think there are people that are thinking about that. I do think um, consumer culture for a lot of people is already threatened. I mean, talk you know i talk about multiple crises and i mean this quite literally those of you probably because you're listening to a kansas city library program uh, know this already you tend to be um you know educated and informed and want to know about things some of you heard about this incredible thing we call the k curve now and so you know we've got this this k curve and and so you know it looks like this right and so this is this is the stock market. Oh man, it just keeps going up and up and up. And that's the question. So yeah, but how many people are invested? How many Americans are invested in the stock market? For those people who are that single female head of household with dependent children, stock market, it doesn't look like that. Her economic, you know, indices doesn't look like that. It looks like maybe that, 
down here. And so they're calling this, or even sometimes this, the K curve. So there's one curve for those that are very wealthy. They have a lot of resources. And then there's another pathway for everyone else or a lot of people. And I think that's the issue. I think the issue is, is that, um, you know, we already have a, a consumer crisis for people who can't afford to buy food, who can't afford to buy milk for their children, you know? And um, um, so I think in some ways we're already there. And, and I think that, that that's part of this discussion that we need. You know, we've, we've got to think about, you know, naming the question. So yeah, do I think we're headed for a consumer culture collapse? I'd say for a lot of Americans, we're already there. They can't live well in this consumer culture. But that doesn't keep, you know, us from seeing, you know, the advertisement for 70 and $80,000 cars, which ironically, now again, here's another irony in it, the most expensive cars are those uh, sports utility vehicle vehicles that are what are supposed to get you closer to nature. <laughs> and yet, you know, it's those internal combustion engines that play a major role in the decline of, you know, the environments that we're in. Thank you. We have a lot of questions and yes. we're, we're wrapping up on time, I believe, in a little bit here. Um, to, to go back to Red Alert. Yes. Mm -hmm. in, in your section on paying attention. Yes. There's a statement that really, really st stuck out to me. Yeah. And you say the separation of knowing and doing is so widely accepted today and can be addressed if we recognize that knowledge resides in our living in this world, not in controlling it. Yes, yes. How can how can we break this, this cycle of concern yeah. to begin yeah. the healing process? Yeah, I, I think, you know, again, this is really, uh, uh, this is one of those fundamental kinds of points that I think we need to, as much as we can, reconsider how much our experiential world in, in a very everyday sense is shaped by what I call um, the room full of mirrors effect. In fact, that, you know, this control, we, we have been pretty, pretty effective in controlling our environments. I mean, look at where you and I are sitting, Cindy. You know, we're inside fairly, you know, comfortable homes and uh, or spaces, interior spaces. But, and, and that tends to foster this idea that we can control our environments, you know, and so we, you know, we've even got air conditioners and heaters in our cars. So we, we move from one box to another box, this box just has four wheels and then we drive around, you know. And so we are so surrounded by environments for control for, for overall our convenience and comfort has worked that we forget what, again, and I'm gonna make this analogy because I think with some of you, it will resonate. Those of you that had grandparents, great-grandparents, maybe even grandparents that were farmers in a sense before farming meant cereal grains where people owned, you know, six or seven or eight sections of land out on the, you know, uh, Western Kansas or Nebraska and made their farm a corporation. Um, I think they understood something about how little we control with the weather, with, you know, when the seasons actually come. And we know what the calendars say, and we know spring tends to come when, you know, sometimes it comes early, sometimes it comes late, you know. And 
Um, I think that that that's the kind of living we need to very seriously reconsider. The one maybe where we're no longer, you know, getting our weather off of something like this, or even using this to find out where we're going. That's another interesting thing. I mean, I'm um, uh, uh, surprised at how many people, young people today, don't even have a real sense of their own immediate geography because they don't need to pay attention. They just need to Google map it, okay? And what does that do? All of that just tells us we don't need to pay attention to any of it. And the fact of the matter is what the world, what the planet is telling us now, we do need to pay attention to that. And so I'm really, you know, so I, I guess, Cindy, what I'm saying is the way we sort of create an awareness of the vast amount of, of our lives, which we don't control, is to try to use some of this technology less, try to, again, I always use the phrase literally get out of doors more. And I think that that's where you find that, you know, you're not in control. By the way, Cindy, this is why people uh, have such a fascination with national parks and wilderness areas. Why do people go there? Because they go there and they're not in a room full of mirrors anymore and they're not in control and they know that. And some people are really hungry for that again. I don't know why we should have to go, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of miles to get that kind of experience again. We could create environments in urban areas, even, you know, with more green spaces, with more attention to creating places out of doors for people um, that they could get that sense again of um, we are in a world where we're not in control. That control is probably one of the biggest illusions we have that we think we're in control and we're really not and now that's the red alert the planet is telling us you know you guys thought you were in control and what you're doing is putting things way out of control maybe in ways that aren't necessarily good thank you um we have we have one more question from the audience that i would okay. like to um, they, they asked, Dr. Wildcat, what is the best way to follow your thought leadership going forward outside of your book? Yeah, so what I would ask you to do is get engaged in, in public forums, get engaged, uh, you know, and, and maybe that's through your local library, maybe that's through your school board. Boy, I tell you, there's so much, I think, that we are right were some really incredible reform in K through 12 education. Um, my new, my, my, the new edition I'm doing now, I'm working on a, a new edition of Power and Place, Indian Education in America. And I'm really focusing on some very practical things we need to do. But I think, you know, we, you think about the teaching of history, you think a lot of the things I've spoken about that I think we should be teaching, um, out of doors. I'm also um, becoming a stronger proponent almost <laughs> every um, month as I look around at what we're facing of the fact that I don't know why we don't have somewhere in uh, a high school experience a semester or an entire year of community internship service. I think, again, our young people often have very little sense of the community that they're a part of, and why should they? I think we could really, and this isn't going to be easy. This means really doing some hard work, but it needs engagement. We need people like 
all of you that are listening in on this, get engaged with the school board, with your county commission, with your city commission, um, create your own neighborhood activities or forums. I think it's all about trying to model uh, what we think is important. And, you know, we try to do that with best, the best we can in how we live. And, and that's really the, the challenge right now to do that. And so I would suggest as you look through Red Alert, you're going to see, I don't try to tell people specific things to do. What I suggest is here's some uh, values, some principles that could guide you in really identifying what you could do where you live to make maybe us be in a world where we were promoting systems of life enhancement. And I think that's, that's kind of my bottom line. There's work for school social workers. Um, and I'm going to say, I do want to close with this because I thought a lot about this, you know, in um, this past year when I was thinking about the Hiawatha Center for Justice. You know, I talk a lot about our relationship with non-human life. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm not painfully aware of before it seems like we can even talk about building respectful relationships with other species on this planet. We've got a lot of work to do to think about how we treat our own kind. And boy, this has been a, this has been a, an incredible year about that. And so I, there's work for everyone and, the, and don't think these things are unrelated. They are related, food justice, housing justice, a health care, education, even the rifts and the crises we're seeing in, in government today. I think we really do need um, to maybe look to the first peoples of this land and see what wisdom they might share with us to help us uh, address some of these really incredibly difficult, wicked problems that we're entangled in right now. Absolutely. Oh, so, so much good work. If, if I may, I'd like to close with your red, red alert of hope. Okay. So you share humankind does not stand above or outside of Earth's life system. If the planet is telling us the problem is the way much of our kind is living, it seems arrogant productive to continue to want to change everything but the way we live. Yes, the world is changing and it is time for us to pay attention, for humankind to find value in our lives as they are intrinsically related to the other than human life of Mother Earth. Let us do so, for like our ancestors before us, we may learn something about ourselves. We may find insights in our oldest indigenous traditions and activities. It is also likely that if we demonstrate respectful attentiveness to the world we live in today, we will find new techniques, new songs, new practices, and even ceremonies for life enhancement. This rep expresses a desire for urgent action based on respectful attentiveness. This red alert is about hope and not fear. No. work. Okay. Essential. Thank you. We thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Sonway uh, Gadasawa, thank you so much. Uh, this has been uh, really fun tonight. And, and um, you know, people just keep your eyes open. And hopefully before the end of this calendar year, you will find uh, both a new edition of Red Alert and a new edition of um, the book I did with my mentor and the Dean of American Indian Studies in uh, North America, uh, the late Vine Deloria Jr., Power in Place, Indian Education in America. So uh, again, just gratitude to everyone and, and uh, I hope you can all go forth and promote systems of life enhancement.
Absolutely. Pidamay, thank you. We appreciate you joining us in a good way this evening. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who joined us. We're always appreciative of our community and we strive to continue and bring you quality programming. Please continue to research our website at caselibrary.org and join us for our next signature event. Thank you and have a great evening.